Here is a Watson Digital Home Theater System, or more accurately, a subwoofer with built-in 5.1 surround sound amplifier. I have done teardown videos of such devices in the past, but this one is different because it was not designed to go along with a computer system. Instead, it was designed to go along with the TV in the living room because it is remote controllable. And that makes this interesting, because having a remote control means you can't just simply use potentiometers. You have to have some sort of signal processing, analog or digital, to make adjustments such as the volume. On the front, we have not a power switch, but a standby button. We have a mode selector for either 5.1 surround sound or 2.1 stereophonic sound. Input selector, master volume control, up or down, and bass volume control, up or down. And in the center, we have four seven-segment displays but we will never know what those did because this unit is completely dead. There is no sign of life whatsoever, not even a standby indicator light. Here is the remote control. This is really cheap. The labeling is just as difficult to make out in real life as it is on camera. We have standby, mute, mode on here labeled 5.1 channel or 2.1 channel, input, which on here lists all the inputs, 5.1 channel, CD or AUX, which by the way does not correspond with the labeling found on the inputs on the back of the unit. We have master volume, up or down, and then we have up and down volume controls for the surround speakers, center speaker, and the subwoofer. Here is the back of the unit. The inputs available on the back date this thing into the 2000s. You could not connect this to a modern-day TV anymore, because all you get are analog inputs. We have the discrete 5.1 channel inputs, AUX1 and AUX2. Those are stereo, of course. The speaker terminals are the nice spring-loaded variety. The impedance of the satellite speakers is supposed to be 8 ohms. They have this label stuck on here. It looks like a bit of an afterthought. It's the Watson model AS6651. Rated input power 80 watts. Down here is a proper power switch, and yes, that was on when I tried this unit, and still it was dead. Down here, the power cord comes into the unit. The back panel is made from a high-density fiber board, at least it sounds like it. And we have all these screws around here, so that is the starting point for the teardown. The back panel has been removed, revealing not much. There is no damping material. The choice of the speaker chassis for the subwoofer also dates this system into the 2000s because, as you can see, this speaker is magnetically shielded, so you could put this system right next to a CRT TV. There is the base reflex port, obviously, one nice detail is the connections to the speaker and the front panel controls and display are all nicely socketed. Surprise, surprise, the cover over the subwoofer is removable, though you can clearly tell by the missing finish you're not supposed to do that. The speaker chassis that they've used is nice. 8 ohms, 50 watts, and it does have a long-lasting rubber surround. After removing four screws, the front panel can be popped out. The inside is completely covered by this circuit board, which is also held in by four screws, which I have taken out. And 
this is where it starts getting ridiculous. There is some labeling around this display. Now, we can see it if I take this board out. Look at that. This is not straight. This is in there at an angle. So much for quality control. It turns out these blue areas were all backlit, as typical for the 2000s. Nice blue lights. So we have all kinds of LEDs on this board for the backlight. We also have the seven-segment displays. These are actually two double seven-segment displays. And as you can see, they never bother to remove the protective film from these displays. <laughs> oh dear. There is the remote control sensor. Quartz crystal. We do have a couple of uh, capacitors, resistors, momentary push buttons, and some transistors to presumably to drive the LED displays. The brain of this panel is on the back right here. This is an EM78P447S 8-bit microcontroller, which is not reusable. Unfortunately, it only has a one-time programmable ROM. And now it finally starts getting interesting. This is what's on the back panel. The back panel itself is actually made from a fairly sturdy piece of MDF. Mains comes in right there. Power switch. Everything is sealed in hot glue, unfortunately. We have a nice big power transformer with two split rail outputs. The low current output goes to over here, to this control and preamplifier board. On here we find two voltage regulators for a symmetric positive and negative 5 volts. And this would have been powered up at all times. The high current output of the transformer, you can clearly tell by the thickness of the wire, goes to this main amplifier board. And this is the only thing that turns off during standby. You can tell because there is a relay. And between these two boards, interfacing the two, is this shielded wire for the audio signals. We have nicely socketed a bundle of wires for the satellite speaker outputs. And then we also have this wire which triggers the relay over here. And I just found the reason why the system was dead. Can you guess it? Yeah, the primary side fuse had gone open. Here it is. It's rated 500 milliampères. And as you can see, this looks perfectly fine. It has not blown violently. But for some reason, it has gone open. I replaced it, and now this nice transformer works. The specifications are listed right there. We have a symmetric 12 volts at 3 amperes, and a symmetric 8 volts at 400 milliamperes. And don't worry, this is something that I have done Originally, it had one of these plastic things over it for insulation. Here is the preamplifier and control circuit board. This contains the aforementioned regulated symmetric 5 volt power supply. It contains the satellite speaker outputs, but those are just a straight pass through coming from this connector. We have the input jacks over here. And those go into this part of the circuit first. We have two 4558 dual operational amplifiers. Those you would expect in a preamplifier. And then we have these chips along here. We have two HCF4053B triple two channel analog multiplexers and demultiplexers. And we have one HCF4052B differential four-channel analog multiplexer and demultiplexer. 
Don't ask me how exactly they are doing it, but those are used to switch inputs. So to select either the discrete 5.1 surround sound input or the two stereo auxiliary inputs. That is controlled by the 8-bit microcontroller on the front. The output from this section of the circuit moves on to a chip that's on the bottom of the board. Here it is. This is an M61538FP six-channel electronic volume control. This is a 5.1-channel surround sound system. 5 plus 1 equals 6. So this chip can adjust the volume of each individual channel. And again, it is controlled by the 8-bit microcontroller on the front panel. The output signal from this chip then continues into this shielded wire, and that ends in this uh, rather interesting configuration of connectors, and that, of course, connects to the main amplifier. And here is the main amplifier board, and this is where we find our good old friend, the TDA-2030A. Now, we have 5.1 equals 6 channels, but there are 7 TDA-2030As. But you can already see these two over here are insulated from the heatsink. And that is because they are run in a bridge mode configuration to double the output power. And those are, of course, for driving the subwoofer. So the subwoofer has more output power available than the five satellite speakers, which, of course, makes perfect sense. The circuitry surrounding the TDA-2030s is not exactly textbook. These are not the circuits listed in the data sheet. They have been simplified. You can clearly see because all the output protection diodes are missing. Aside from the TDA-2030A circuits, we have the power supply, rectifier bridge over here. These are some proper 3 ampere rated diodes. The filter capacitors over here are a little bit on the low side, 4700 microfarads at 25 volts. That could certainly do with a higher capacity than that. And then we have this relay to turn the main amplifier on and off. The bottom of the board looks rather messy, and I have my doubts about whether or not this heatsink is really sufficiently sized for seven TDA-2030As. And that's it. That's what made the Watson Digital Home Theater System work. Now, I know this stuff is far from being proper hi-fi equipment, but I always find it fascinating how they made these systems work at a relatively low budget. And there are always plenty of components that you can salvage for your own electronic projects. And I have already started salvaging components from these boards. Here are all the super bright blue LEDs from the front panel. And certainly, we'll also see the TDA-2030As make appearances in future projects. Thank you for watching.